first I'm just going to summarize where we got to last time by looking at the neuron simulation that you'll be doing in the lab. Uh, this is what it looks like. And basically, uh, if you run it, you see the neuron get excited. What we want to do is look at the plot here. I'm going to reset that and run that again. And you can see as time flows across the x-axis here, the horizontal dimension of this plot, um, at this point, 10 seconds, 10 milliseconds into the time point here, a excitatory input gets turned on, and that causes the membrane potential, the VM, uh, plotted in blue, to rise up until it gets to that critical threshold, which in this case um, ends up being 0.5, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, and then the neuron fires a spike, which you can see in the purple color. Um, that causes the membrane potential to be reset back down to its kind of initial starting point. This is the kind of initial resting point. Um, and then the process uh, resumes again. Uh, membrane potential rises up and gets reset, etc. The net current down here at the bottom starts out at zero when the neuron is at rest. It's at, the, it's at its initial resting potential. Um, this kind of is corresponding to this minus 0.75 uh, millivolts and then uh, as the excitatory input comes on the current rises up sharply um, this burst of excitation comes in um, but as the membrane potential goes up the current goes down why is that now you remember yes the current is proportional to the difference between the membrane potential and the driving potential. So the driving potential for the excitatory input is somewhere up here in the high level of this graph. And as the membrane potential comes up, then that, I think it's actually up here at one, uh, the um, current goes down proportionally because the membrane potential is getting closer, uh, even though it doesn't get that close, it still gets closer to the uh, driving potential for excitation. This is what we were talking about last time in terms of the dynamics of updating of the membrane potential in response to the current that changes the balance uh, of forces at play. And so the whole system is kind of evolving and updating dynamically as uh, it integrates these excitatory and inhibitory signals over time. In this model, we're looking at discrete spiking. Um, and uh, we also have a, um, a sodium gated potassium channel plotted in orange which causes the spikes to get kind of more spaced out and weaker over time this is a, a factor of accommodation there's more information about this in the textbook uh, it is an important property of neurons that they kind of fatigue and and get tired of firing over time we'll see this in a number of our models as we go through uh, it's another important biological property of neurons um, but we won't go too much into the details of that here. That's the kind of big picture uh, at this point about what all those equations are doing. They're allowing the neuron to respond to an input with some rate of spiking. If we increase the amount of excitation that comes into the cell, we can do that by increasing this thing called G bar E, which is the amount of excitation, um, the strength of excitation essentially uh, then the neuron, as you can see, spikes more frequently. We are computing in this green line a kind of overall rate of spiking based on these actual spikes. That's uh, empirically kind of computed as a function of the spikes, and you can see that that value goes up as we get more excitation. Um, if we go the other way and run the model with less excitation, so now this, the height of this black uh, line here on the input is lower, we're getting less excitation, and now the cell is responding more slowly and therefore uh, less frequent firing to these inputs. And in fact, if we go sufficiently low, we can really get close to the overall firing threshold. And if we go below that threshold, we're still getting excitation, but look at this. 
there's the current is coming in. We're getting a very small amount of excitatory current. It's enough to push that membrane potential up, but as that mem membrane potential rises, the net current gets pulled back down because the balance of forces starts to re reach that equilibrium value that we talked about, the ratio of the excitation over the excitation plus inhibition plus leak. Um, and we're seeing that that actually does reach the equilibrium value in this case because it doesn't spike. And so the spiking kind of resets everything and has it start all over again. But if you're below that spiking threshold, then you actually reach the equilibrium threshold and that's mathematically what it is um, here uh, where the forces have balanced and now the system kind of reaches a new equilibrium, a new, a new resting state of, sort of, of sorts. In our detector example, if you're looking at a three or a, a seven or something and it doesn't really fit with those eight uh, features that you're looking for, then that doesn't give enough excitation coming into the cell and it, it stays below threshold and it says, uh, I'm nothing interesting happening from my perspective right now, I'm not gonna fire. And that's an important principle uh, in cells as it is in people, nothing's happening. You do appreciate if people don't like post on Facebook saying, hey, nothing's happening, or hey, I had breakfast today, right? But rather they kept, them, kept that information to themselves. And so neurons in general in the brain are very uh, respectful of other neurons, they don't uh, fire excessively. Um, if there's nothing interesting happening, a neuron may occasionally fire a spike, you know, every, every so often. Um, but typically, uh, they're fairly quiet. Um, you know, so certain parts of the brain are more active, but most of them are very quiet. Um, and then when they see something that they like, they can fire uh, at most about 100 times per second, or 100 hertz. That's about the maximum kind of biological firing rate. So that's kind of the range of signals that you get in, in neural firing.